Um, now we have we have to define uh, the difference between financing with recourse and non recourse financing. So, financing with recourse means that the in case there is a problem and in case the funds have to be repaid, we can actually go ahead and we have recourse to the corporate balance sheet and the corporate financing and balance sheet financing. So, you have recourse to the rest of the funds of that company and uh, non recourse financing means that the lenders only have recourse, they are only have access to the cash flows of the project and the assets and the project assets in the event of project failure. So, in case the project fails, the assets may be liquidated and those returns can be used uh, to pay off the, the organizations that have given us the finance. But in the in case that is not sufficient, the company is at the corporate who has the, the who has created that is at arm's length. The risk is only to be met from the cash flows of the project and the project assets. So this is the difference between uh, recourse and non-recourse financing. Let us move forward now. Uh, we'd like to take a look and this is a this is from the landscape of climate finance it's a 2012 report which gives you an idea of the different kinds of financing available for green energy and uh, you can see that there are two types you can differentiate between public funds and private funds and uh, in the case of public funds there could be carbon market revenues, carbon related taxes and general taxes. So, some part of the general taxes can be used to finance the uh, provide um, funds to the uh, public financial intermediaries, the development financial institutions, national bilateral and multilateral climate funds. So, for instance, in the, the Indian case, we have an organization, a specialized organization called IREDA which is the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency. And this IREDA essentially has can provide soft loans uh, which can provide uh, loans at much lower interest rate. So, often what has been done is IREDA has a scheme where it will finance a part of the debt which is being given by some of the uh, conventional corp banks and if we look at that bank. Uh, we, we you can provide we are giving 30 percent of the debt for example at an interest rate of 5 percent and if you are looking at a debt ratio fraction that is 70 percent it will mean that 21 percent of the total amount required is being financed uh, and is being financed at this low interest rate of 5 percent. And we can uh, look at this and this results in some uh, as a result of this we have some risk management, some grants, some instruments which are there policy instruments when we talk about policies and policy instruments we will come back to this. Uh, in the case of institutional uh, investors, they can 
uh, look at project level mar market debt and then project level equity and then there could be balance sheet financing. Again here uh, in terms of private fund institutional investors, the project developers, the corporate actors, the households, everyone can provide funding and uh, with this then we can have the dispersal channels and predominantly if you look at it, it has been mainly financing mitigation, the energy efficiency, renewables projects, but also some amount of money going into adaptation, a relatively smaller group amount of money going in for adaptation. Uh, now, if you look at the kind of numbers we are looking at, you will see that uh, this is uh, showing you, you can look at landscape of climate finance in 2015-16, it shows you the different types of flows which are going from one end to the other and the kind of investments which are required and uh, you will see that we are talking of a 463 billion US dollars as the kind of order of magnitude of financing. Um, most of the, as we saw, most of this has been for mitigation, that means for reducing the CO2 emissions and reducing the climate change. And increasingly what is happening is that a lot of this financing is now going to the developing countries. And um, about one third going to the large developing countries, China, Brazil and India. And out of this um, 85 billion US dollars are coming from government budgets and development financial institutions. In the case of China, its development financial institutions account for 30 percent and in India about 7 percent. Uh, so if we look at the distribution uh, of the renewable based investment, in uh, 2018, uh, this is from the uh, Bloomberg um, New Energy Finance Report in 2019, uh, you find that 2.6 trillion is the total amount of uh, investments in renewable of which if you see solar is the largest chunk, uh, little more than half because it is 1.3 trillion and wind is uh, another uh, 1 trillion. So these are the two chunks, then you have uh, some amount going to geothermal, some biomass and waste and small hydro and biofuels. Of course, this can change as the, as the technologies sort of change, but right now it is predominantly solar and wind. If we look at the net capacity added in renewables, again this is from the Bloomberg uh, New Energy Financing Report, you can see very clearly that in terms of installed capacity, solar 638, um, 638 gigawatt and 467 gigawatt of wind and 283 gigawatt of hydro. Interestingly, coal is about 529 gigawatt and gas for 438 gigawatt. Of course, this is talking about one decade and uh, you, the interesting thing to see is that in this particular decade, the renewable installed capacity uh, outpaces the additional capacity from coal and gas. Of course, this coal and gas has much higher capacity factors. So, in terms of generation, uh, the picture will be a little more balanced when maybe the thermal will be higher in terms of the generation. Of course, this is over a 10-year time period as we go forward and we are looking at, if you look at only 2018 or 2019, you will find that the share of renewables has increased even more especially by installed capacity and of course now we are trying to report it more by the generation. So out of these, if you see the kind of sources of finance, you will find that the bulk of it, we said 2.6 trillion out of which more than 2 trillion is asset financing, which is where you are trying to build a power plant or you want to finance that asset and the value of asset is mortgaged against that and you have an escrow, you can always uh, sell that and get your money in case the project does not work properly. Uh, then small distributed capacity of funding, some, some government funding, some public markets and overseas R&D. Uh, 
corporate R&D, sorry, corporate R&D a little bit from that, but predominantly asset finance. Uh, we can look at different sources. This is from a report which talks about uh, U.S. Uh, solar and the way in which U.S. solar has been financed and can be financed and in this a number of different sources for instance venture capital, the development, private equity, infrastructure uh, funds, uh, hedge funds, uh, banks, uh, the large corporations, mutual funds and retail in investors and then you can see what is the targeted rate of return? For instance, venture capital would target about 30% rate of return. Private equity may have a slightly lower rate of return expected. Infrastructure funds have definitely rates of return uh, less than about 11%. And hedge funds uh, for a period of about a year and they, that would have lower rates of return. Uh, banks will have their commercial rates and these are these vary from country to country and uh, so 7 percent, 5 percent, 8 percent, 9, 10, 11 percent, those that is the kind of order of magnitude which you are looking at. Uh, large corporations also may provide funds and they would have slightly uh, um, uh, lower uh, um, uh, rates of return expected. Uh, the mutual funds, retail investors. Again, relatively low rates of return and uh, in each of these cases, a comparison has been done in the, uh, in the uh, characteristics of the uh, um, funding and the fund source. This table continues and you can look at uh, increasingly uh, pension funds and endowments which are maintained and <laughs> the, these pension funds are invested in order to create the, uh, uh, see that we get the type of returns and so this has uh, expectations of slightly lower uh, returns, uh, 7 to 8 percent, but they normally will not invest in very risky projects. Utilities again have some rates of return and these are for the US utilities. Insurance companies have quite a lot of funds. The vendors and the EPC installers, land owners and of course the government. So you can see very uh, large number of different types of uh, funding sources and each one has slightly different characteristics. Uh, this is again from the uh, BNEF and it just shows you a time series trend of the kind of renewable investments which have been made and you can very clearly see that the largest chunk of this investment and it's been growing has been in PV and in the case of onshore wind that's been growing at a reasonable rate but it's been surpassed by PV in the uh, recent times and then of course one can look at other things like uh, the uh, offshore and the solar thermal and, and so on. So this is the sort of order of magnitude of the current trends. Uh, there is an interesting report by Srimali and Nelson which compares the costs of financing renewables in India with US and Europe and uh, in that if you look at it, it talks about the different types of investors. We are talking of uh, large scale commercial banks, some uh, venture capital, private equity insurance funds and development financial institutions and of the large number of such institutions which are there for financing our investors, the ones which are active in the renewable sector is a smaller subset of this. Uh, and this comparison has been done by Nelson et al to try and see when we talk about solar PV and wind, what are the different components which uh, leads to the cost of electricity that we are getting. And uh, as compared to uh, running the same plant in India and the US, uh, we can see that essentially the finance cost uh, increases the cost of energy by a certain percentage, but there are many other factors which can decrease the cost of energy. Similarly, if you are looking at the uh, 
of onshore wind and the capex India's lower capex reduces the cost and uh, so based on this um, the India's financing costs increase the cost uh, and by 22 uh, percent it's a re reasonable chunk and so one can offset some of the uh, improvements that we were getting but then uh, we can take a call of the, of the kind of investment. Uh, similarly, um, on different projects, uh, we've looked at the expectation in terms of rates of return for debt and equity, and uh, we can see very clearly that in the Indian context, uh, the uh, debt is available at much higher rates than uh, uh, than in other countries of the world, and because of that. Uh, we can see that there is a uh, when we talk about the increase this results in some increasing costs uh, of course we have had a big advantage in terms of reducing mitigating some of the risks having large projects being bid we had this reverse bidding concept and with all the facilities and land being provided and uh, since those risks reduce we have been able to actually reduce the price of electricity from such facilities and in the case of uh, renewables and photovoltaics that has actually gone down to uh, less than 2 rupees 50 uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, and of course, so we can see in the case of India, the interest rates are uh, higher than many of the other countries. Uh, now, the question which one may ask then is that should we be taking international debt? Now, this itself has its own problems because there is an uh, there is an interest rate ceiling on the foreign debt, and then there is there are some issues related to swapping of the currencies and the exchange rate. And with all of this, you see that some of the benefit that we could get by getting low interest foreign debt are actually wiped out and uh, the Indian debt and foreign debt are equivalent. Uh, we can uh, look at a variable rate which is uh, floating and as the uh, over the time as the uh, conditions change the rate could change or we can go for a fixed rate kind of debt. Um, so, in general in this uh, report they have compared the different kinds of factors which affect the availability, which uh, affect the costs. And if you look at the main report, you will be able to see uh, issues related to renewable specific issues, there are foreign investment, and there is a, a tech specific issues, there is site specific and state specific, and there is a financial market. Similar thing that was for debt, a similar thing is available also for equity. So this will give us, give you an idea, if you go through it, it will give you an idea of what are the kind of issues related to debt and equity and what are the expected uh, returns from both in the Indian context uh, as compared to the global context. And so, so this is the type of projects. Uh, based on this, some calculations have been done uh, with uh, the debt and equity and the debt equity spread. Uh, let us move forward with this and then see. So, financing uh, in the case of uh, uh, Nelson et al, they showed that the financing adds a significant proportion about 20, more than 28, 25 uh, percent to the LCOE. And uh, this is a problem even uh, the uh, kind of high the costs of debt uh, result in this kind of an issue. And you can see this is as we talked about the type of rates of return of debt and equity uh, in India and Europe and you can see very clearly in the case of debt, in the case of equity if you see uh, the equity rates of return which we are uh, expecting and the equity uh, uh, equity return in the case of uh, required return on the uh, rate percentage per year, you can see 
that uh, equity is in the same range. Actually, Europe and US expect higher e e um, uh, returns on equity. Uh, while in the case of debt, we can clearly see that much, much lower interest debt is available in most of the countries of the world as compared to India. And because of that, this will add to our costs of power generation, costs of renewables. And this has been added to see uh, what happens in terms of financing and how much does it add to the overall cost. And then we also talked about the interest rates and the fluctuation in the interest rates and these can be used to make the calculations. One can actually then calculate for a given amount of debt and equity uh, what would be the price of uh, electricity finally that we get in terms of rupees per kilowatt hour. And as I also told you that there is not much advantage to be got by taking uh, um, debt, international debt and uh, the foreign exchange rate and the other issues related to uh, an international debt would result in the same cost finally and so there is not much uh, incentive to go for the uh, for this. We talked about the debt and summary and the equity summary. And finally, if you see the feed-in tariffs were supposed to be, uh, has been shown to be better. There are other mechanisms, the clean uh, development mechanism, accelerated depreciation, generation based incentive and some income tax exemption. Uh, the uh, mechanisms which are there when we talk in terms of uh, there were initially we started off with the preferential tariff which is a feed-in tariff but subsequently what has happened is that we now have uh, the renewable purchase obligation and each of the distribution companies is mandated that it has to meet a minimum percentage of its generation or of its supply which is coming from renewables and if it is not possible to actually add that much generating capacity, then it is quite possible for the company to actually uh, buy from other companies which have supplied that much and buy the renewable energy certificate and that renewable uh, energy certificate will enable it to meet its RPO requirement, renewable purchase obligation requirement. The renewable purchase obligation requirement percentages have varied from state to state and several of the states have not, uh, distribution companies are not meeting that requirement and this has uh, also been a struggle. Uh, so the option, uh, we will, when we discuss policy, we will discuss the feed-in tariffs versus the RPO kind of issues. There is another interesting paper which you may want to look at, this is by Srimali et al. It is in energy policy and we will send you the link. You can essentially compare a whole set of what he has done in this paper is their authors have compared a whole set of different projects where they are looking at improved cookstoves and using business models and market mechanism to see the deployment of these in, in improved cookstoves. When we look at cooking, if you see the cooking, you know, this is a nomogram which is there in the World Health Organization. It is also part of the global energy assessment and you can see that as we go from uh, the traditional cookstoves and traditional stoves, then you go to wood stoves, charcoal stoves improved charcoal and, and uh, then you go to the LPG and the electric. And in all of this, if you see that as we go down this line, as we go in this direction, the amount of time taken for cooking would be uh, significantly lower. And so, so that's, that's an important parameter. You can also see that the capital costs will increase as we move in this direction. And then, of course, uh, when we talk in terms of stove efficiencies, you will see that these, these correspond to higher stove efficiencies. And so, there are multiple trade-offs and one has to see uh, how to manage these trade-offs.
and uh, for these companies they have different kinds of price ranges and different kinds of mechanisms by which they would operate and these mechanisms have been compared in this paper and I'm not going to go into too much details of that but uh, the number of years uh, when the first stove was uh, in, uh, disseminated and marketed and then you have a scatter in terms of the total number of the stoves which have been distributed and uh, the kind of approximate years since the distribution of the first stove. And interestingly, uh, this is a table which shows the different kinds of comparison of these technologies. That means the technology in design, then the target customers who are the target customers are they household or commercial and based on that they would talk about different sizes and uh, then there's external enterprise building management experience and mm, the scale at which it would operate and whether it's sustainable or not and the rationale for assessment of financial sustainability so in all of these you can look at the different models and uh, there's a tableau and a matrix which compares them on different basis. So please take a look at this paper and this will give you an idea of how these different models can be compared and especially in terms of how the um, stoves are financed. And then as we said, this is, this is in terms of different kinds of sustainability. Uh, now let me talk to you about a couple of examples and then we will uh, do some calculations in terms of financing. So, one example uh, which is uh, there in terms of financing is an example uh, from the Ahmedabad electricity company. Uh, now, in the distribution companies, uh, one of the issues is that you have to supply the active power, but uh, based on the fact that many of the smaller industries and commercial establishments have essentially uh, have low power factor and you have to supply much more reactive power to be able to meet the requirements and the active power that they need. So one of the simplest solutions is for the industry to compensate and to do static power factor correction and uh, it could do statistic power factor correction, you could do automatic power factor correction, but basically we need to put capacitor banks and this will be installed in the company. And so the project here in Ahmedabad is to relatively smaller industries and companies which uh, did not have the ability uh, or the capital to be able to make the investments. Uh, in a large set of um, capacitors. So, these uh, instead of this, the capacitors were leased from the manufacturer. This is Sahas Prague uh, Limited and these were leased to the end user. Uh, the As a result of this, since the maximum demand reduces, the electricity bill would reduce and some part of uh, in on a monthly basis, some part of the lease rental would be repaid to the distribution company, that is the Ahmedabad Electricity Company, and uh, this lease rental minus the administrative cost will go to some account, which is an escrow account, and then the lease rental fee goes back to the company. The, the IREDA provide takes some charge from the escrow account. But finally, this lease rental fee and the, uh, is repaid and this is used to repay the loan to IREDA. So that is the kind of mechanism, it is a very neat mechanism. What happens in this is that the uh, end user benefits by the virtue of reduced bills. Some part of that benefit is paid to the distribution company as an electricity bill lease rental. From this electricity company with the lease rental minus the administrative cost goes to an account on which the IREDA has the first right of taking the money uh, so that they get a repayment on their loan. SAS Sprague after getting the revenue from the lease rental fee uh, also 
repays uh, ERERA. And with the result that this is something where we are able to see the deployment even though the end user does not have the ability to actually purchase all these capacitors. So they lease the capacitors and over a period of time through the bill this is recovered by the electricity company and then paid to the manufacturers and pay back the loan to the financing agency or ERADA. Uh, a similar kind of uh, scheme was started for the switch from incandescence to compact fluorescence. And so the idea, this was called the budget lamp yojana and the idea was that the lamps were issued by the retailers, uh, the invoices were made by the suppliers, the re reimbursement was done and there was some partial payment by the customers which resulted in payment to the financial institute. So if you look at this scheme, this is what was proposed by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency uh, and you have these, the technology is the compact fluorescent lamp and then uh, we had the uh, CFL being given at very low prices to the household and there was a guarantee also in, involved. And uh, when we aggregate all of this, because of the switch from incandescent to compact fluorescent, there's CO2 save. This is aggregated and put in as a requirement. It's standardized and we apply for carbon credits and get funding for the carbon credits. Now, this entire financing was dependent on a certain price for the CER or the certified emission reduction. Using that price, we can make this as a viable option. However, during this time when this happened, the CER market crashed and the CER prices came down so that it was not no longer viable to have this and there were relatively less stakeholders coming for this in some of in the districts and at the state level and with the result that of course uh, there, there was also a technology uh, change and a technology risk because essentially LEDs took over from CFLs and so it was no longer worthwhile to sort of push CFLs but to go to the uh, LEDs. And the dependence on the carbon market resulted in uh, $12 per ton initial CER price that is what was uh, budgeted but actually it came down to $5 per ton and uh, the payments given the kind of complexity of the system, the manufacturers and utilities take three to four years and uh, the actual target was uh, not much, much lower than what was targeted and uh, it was also one of the problems was the lack of investors and I said that the risk because of the CER has also created. In the case of uh, rural access and village um, electrification, you find a large number of small case studies. We also find a number of companies and startups operating in this domain and uh, it's interesting to try to compare across this. We do not have time to go into details of this, but I'll just show you some examples. For instance, uh, one of the successful uh, uh, companies is uh, Selco. Uh, and that Selco was a for-profit company, uh, solar home systems, started in 1996. And the idea in this is its main, uh, they had some innovations in technology, but its main innovation was in financing. And uh, essentially, they, they were doing this in an area in Karnataka, which was known for a uh, large number of successful banks. And so they partnered with nine banks and with a particular interest rate. And then they also, the company also decided that the margin money, that means the initial upfront payment which was to be given, which people found often in the smaller, poorer households difficult to give, they would arrange for that um, for the uh, household or the consumer. And uh, financial institutions pay the largest chunk of this, uh, monthly payments of 300 to 400 rupees over a period of about five years. Uh, the financing and repayment options were tailor-made to the end users. Um, so one of the interesting thing which Harish Hande, Dr. Harish Hande talks about, he's the person who started Selco, is that a street vendor uh, 
is not able to pay 300 rupees per month but the street vendor is easily able to pay 10 rupees per day so if you have a collection mechanism for a street vendor where you collect on a daily basis then that is a benefit in some cases uh, if you had a farmer which had two crops then uh, you could have a payment schedule which is twice a year uh, coinciding with the um, crops being sold in the market and then they also arrange for funding from different agencies to meet the margin amount for pure poor customers one of the biggest benefits that they could do is they made customers bankable by providing them an incentive and by providing them some guarantees and ensuring that they interface with the banks. Uh, there is another model which is Desi Power predominantly in Bihar and their model was to aggregate, have local distributors and then they got government funding, they got some equity which they put in and uh, they uh, looked at energy efficiency, they tried to tie up with enabling micro enterprises and tie up with telecom towers to increase the capacity factors and so they in many of the cases instead of putting meters they just charge the monthly rate and then uh, based on the number of bulbs or loads and they had a circuit breaker to limit the consumption so that means if you exceeded that limit over a couple of months you would be disconnected from the supply uh, <clears throat> there is this concept of uh, energy service company now as we saw uh, you know, uh, we actually do not need energy per se, but we need the service that energy provides. And uh, energy service company essentially comes into an industry or a commercial organization and says, we will supply you the energy. You are currently paying a certain amount for your energy. Continue to pay that amount. We'll invest in energy efficiency or in renewables. And out of the savings, you share some of the savings with us. And so we take some of the risk and then we do this. So this is of course dependent on a whole host of things including contracting. It's an interesting concept but it hasn't taken off much in the Indian, uh, in the Indian context for a variety of reasons. But uh, just to tell you that the energy service concept, ESCO, uh, energy service company concept is not old. The earliest known record of an ESCO is James Watt's company and he, his proposal was we will leave a steam engine free of charge for you. We will install these and we will take over for five years the customer service. So that means five year annual maintenance contract of customer service. We guarantee you that the coal for the machine costs less than you must spend at present as fodder on the horses which do the same amount of work. So this if it's horse driven and then you are feeding the horses the amount of money that is paid to feed the horses and number of horses you get a saving by when we look at these kind of uh, machines where we are looking at coal and then using that to get the steam engine and uh, so what is required in this case to what the agreement is everything that we require of you is to, that you give us a third of the money which you save. So one third of the saving will go to James Watt's company and this was the kind of model as I told you the first uh, known ESCO. We talked about Desi Power and the other model was Husk Power. Husk Power of course started off by getting uh, funding for their idea in terms of prize money and then they uh, started directly reaching the end user and uh, looked at doing the estimation of the demands accurately. Um, so with this we end the portion on uh, financing. We are going to look at these concepts in terms of doing a couple of examples. So with this uh, we have seen the overall uh, history of project financing. We have looked at the different sources of finance. We have looked at debt and equity, uh, risks and returns. We have also looked at the way in which uh, you have either you have recourse and non-recourse kind of financing. Uh, we have looked at a couple of examples of how this financing is done. Uh, in the next module, we will take this forward and then do some calculations in terms of when we look at a loan, how much do we have to repay and then take an example to decide 
how do we decide the debt equity ratio? 